Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Art Basel in Miami Beach, our conversations program. It's our final day today, and I'm very happy that we're kicking off with this exciting panel, The Artist and the Gallerist, moderated by Julieta Aranda, who is an artist and uh, founder of EFLUX, based between Berlin and New York. I'm going to hand over to Julieta to introduce our speakers, and um, I hope you all enjoy. Please um, give a warm applause to our speakers. Thank you. Um, hi, well, it's a pleasure to, in my turn, to moderate a talk, actually to be in an all-female panel, so that's really, really nice. Um, we have today uh, Wendy Olsoff, who is the co-founder of PPOW Gallery, and that has been running for the last 35 years, if I'm not mistaken. She will do a much better job than me in explaining the gallery. Um, and then there is Robin Williams, who is an artist uh, living in New York, painter uh, with an illustration background, graduated from RISD, and working with PPOW uh, for the last eight years, I think. Um, so I guess I'll leave you now to introduce yourself a little bit more fully. Uh, thank you. And um, so I'm Wendy Olsoff, and my partner, Penny Pilkington, and I opened a gallery in the East Village in 1983, and PPOW is our initials. And we have a history of showing political work, showing queer artists, feminist artists, which took root in the early 80s. Um, and that's in, in a nutshell. And we've moved from the East Village to Soho to Chelsea over the years. We've had a lot of different experiences with a lot of different artists and uh, locations. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Robin F. Williams. Um, I'm a painter. Uh, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Um, went to the Rhode Island School of Design, got a degree in illustration, and um, sort of decided somewhere towards the end of my undergraduate degree that I wanted to pursue painting. Um, so I sort of did both for a while. <laughs> um, landed on painting when I realized um, that art directors would tell you what to do, and I didn't like that. <laughs> so um, sort of realized what I needed to make were paintings, um, that that was where my creative impulse was really headed. And um, started working first with another gallery in Brooklyn, and then for a short time, and then um, my first show at PPOW in, in 2010, I think. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, because I, I think we are always wondering what is the shortest route to success as artists? How are we going to make it? How are we going to get to the, you know, to have a gallery in New York and whatnot? So, and I guess the truth is that there is never a straight path uh, towards that. And I was reading about the, uh, how you guys met, and there is, I guess, the, you were the um, BAM uh, Playbill artist at some point, right. and then you met through this kind of like chance encounter. So, um, can you just like talk talk us through that sequence of events? Sure. Um, you can. I, we probably have a slightly different perspective yeah. on this. <laughs> it would be nice to hear both, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, as a, as a dealer, you always have your ears open to people making suggestions to you. And I think I've learned to listen really well to when people say to look at something. So there was a great serendipity because uh, uh, someone I knew who knew our program had been working at the Brooklyn Academy of Music doing their artist program for the Playbill and said, um, there's a painting you should see by Robin Williams. <laughs> and um, you know, I took it in, and coincidentally, I was going to BAM to see a performance, and I saw this painting, and I went, wow, you know, that is really pretty good painting. Um, I'm going to call this artist. And so, you know, I then found Robin's number, not even knowing if she was a man or a woman. You know, I just called and made the studio appointment, um, and it led to a conversation, which eventually led to an exhibition. Um, is that what? Yeah. No, that sounds accurate. Um, I think I had just uh, left my gallery in Brooklyn. Um, I had one show there. Um, 
and it was uh, not a very professional space. <laughs> uh, and I realized I needed to move on. I was also considering going to graduate school around that time. Um, and I was in a group show and someone from the Brooklyn Academy of Music, someone on the board, saw my work and asked me to be um, their spring playbill artist. Um, so I exhibited a few works uh, in their lobby and then they printed an image of my work on their playbill. Um, and then, yeah, was lucky enough to be put in touch with Wendy or have Wendy reach out to me and that's how it happened. Um, I, I guess something that's also interesting to hear is about the relationship that you have. I mean, as an artist, how you were saying that you were working with a gallery that was not very professional uh, first. So having a gallery that where you have like a close relationship with, the, with your galleries, does it make a uh, difference in how your work develops? And how, how and for you is like, how do you see when this work and how do you see it over time? I think I, think I understand the question. And I think when, Ra just to sort of, I think what's really great that happened over the last eight years, I think that Robin came to our gallery at a time where her work was really growing and she could respond to our history at the same time. So she was a younger voice, because we have very, we have artists, we have estates, we have older artists, but we still look at young artists, and Robin obviously was one of those people. Um, we had a history of liking and loving painting, which is, a lot of galleries don't do, at, didn't do at the time. So we had that inbuilt history, but we also had a political context. And I think what was so great and what's really good about the story is that Robin and the gallery simultaneously sort of came into this moment, um, which the audience can really understand because of um, politics and the Me Too movement and um, uh, politics in general and women's issues. Like Robin's work really speaks to not only women but men also. Um, and, um, and so it just, and our gallery too does that as a whole. So she brings an amazing voice to our program and builds on what we've been doing. And, and it's not like a game plan. It just was sort of, you know, good chemistry mm -hmm. and responsibility and drive and, you know, magic and talent also. <laughs> so that sort of. And I think like um, the question is more thinking as to how you see her work towards the future, meaning um, it's, you know, like do you develop a relationship where you are thinking, okay, so I, I see my artist here now, this is what I see her in five years, this is what I see her in 10, 15 years kind of thing. Do you think I like that? I don't really think like that because I can't even think about that. I can have a fantasy of mm -hmm. what that is. And I know that's that. It would be a fantasy. I can think, well, our gallery is going to, you know, I, make, I can make something up. You know, it could be whatever I'd say and have this relevance and importance or, and Robin's just going to continue to make important, amazing paintings and we're all gonna live happily ever after. But, you know, there's no way of predicting anything. You know, I can't even really predict what will be in six months time. So we just, Penny and I have always really very much work from, with a group of people and with our instincts and with our hearts to really be relevant to what's going on now and continue to do that and not worry about the, what's gonna happen in the future so much. It's, it's funny you say that, but from, from my perspective and having worked with this other gallery first that was um, a much newer gallery and had a very sh short life, I think they were, they were around for maybe eight, eight years or something like that before they had to close. Um, and, uh, and then coming to work with PPOW, um, just having that much experience and time and um, you know, the programming, having so much history, even if the art world seems very volatile, you, you guys projected a <laughs> sense of like p more permanence or stability. Um, yeah, I, and, I, and just in the difference between like putting a show together, that first gallery, and I was very young too, um, that first show, 
but I remember having an instinct to kind of curate my own show and edit and leave things in or out, and it was my gallerist at that time who said like, no, just put everything you have on the wall. <laughs> he was sort of more focused in just like selling anything that anyone would want uh, for any reason. Um, and as an inexperienced artist, I sort of just deferred to that and said like, okay, I guess we'll put everything up. Um, and then working with PPOW, I mean, I did get a sense that you had such more of like a long-term vision and more patience and uh, perspective. And y you know, y you would slow me down a lot. Right, we won't put up a show like a Robin's painting. We won't just say your show is in 18 months and no matter what you make, we'll show it. You know, we wait till the work is completely, uh, where every painting is, feels like a completely finished, good painting and we're all happy with it because you know you don't get a lot of chances to have shows in New York or in other cities and you have to make it you know you always want to do your best work and sometimes you know you do your best work and it's not successful it's not to say it's going to be a success but we plan ahead investing in the future that way I, that's that's kind of like the what yeah. the the knot of the question i guess and I also wanted to ask you, because your gallery, PPOW, has um, like a very strong political and critical backbone, the, the kind of artists that you show and the history of the gallery itself. And um, I mean, like traditionally people are, like see painting as not, especially these days, not where, not as the uh, form where criticality lives, I think. Um, it's, it has a different um, position. So, but then looking at your work, Robin, it does have a very strong stance and you do put some critical focus mm -hmm. in it. So how do you, you know, how do you negotiate that and how do you come to the point of showing painting with the kind of political history that you have? You were saying that you, like, that you have always showed painting. Penny and I come from backgrounds where we love painting, figurative painting. Um, so when we met, you know, we showed like, the work of Suko, we've showed the work of other painters over the years. In fact, our program has become less painting-based as time has gone on. Um, but, you know, finding someone who can make a relevant painting is the biggest challenge in the art world because you have, you know, 500, 600 years of painting. So I think that even though it's not the most critical, it's the hardest in some way because you're competing with all this history. Of course, women are not competing with that history because they were excluded from that history. So in a certain sense, Robin has an open field uh, and as many other women artists, because they can paint from their experience now with, uh, with a, a confidence and a freedom never had before. Um, but there, again, the challenge is to make a good painting. So, you know, I think Robin um, is able to produce paintings and really came to owning it with her last show, which is this, this painting was in it. Um, and I think then it will roll through the other paintings, I hope. But it embraces a, 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 and what you can see in these slides is the technique of the work and the complexity, which maybe Robin can talk about, but the empowerment of a woman who sort of could be any age, who is modeled on past tropes, but embodies a strength and um, a, a female experience, direct female experience that I think doesn't intimidate men. I think a lot of p women artists tend to uh, sometimes do that, not on purpose, but they're looking at like Carolee Schneeman and other artists who use their bodies and they're copying that. Robin's really inventing a new language based on the past. It's sort of how I feel about it. So even though um, it's painting, I feel it's bringing a completely new language. And a lot of, I think, younger artists painting or artists even Robin's age are looking at Robin as a uh, role model of someone who's kind of captured this zeitgeist right now. Mm. Um, Great um, painting. I guess let's, uh, let's talk now about like the paintings themselves. Okay. Um, I think you were saying that you don't make that many paintings. So, um, I mean, like more or less would be nice to hear about your 
production rhythm, how, you know, like how did you get to a painting, to the subject matter, and to decide what technique you use with mm -hmm. each one of them? Um, so I'd say I make around, um, if I'm working full time in the studio, sort of like 12 to 15 paintings a year, something like that. With And then usually every painting has a um, drawing. Um, and that's become very important to the process as the paintings have become more uh, mixed media. I used to work exclusively in oil. Um, and these paintings that you're seeing now, this is the one that's uh, in PPW's booth um, at the fair right now. Um, so now we're going back to my older work where this is um, exclusively oil. Um, but the work that I've been doing in the last maybe three years has been uh, using airbrush, all kinds of different acrylic mediums, um, different techniques and effects to create lots of different textures which don't all um, show up in the slides. But, um, and that's sort of exploring um, every different level of the canvas. So I'm um, staining raw canvas sometimes. Um, then I'm using acrylic, different layers of um, texture, and then oil is the last thing that I put on, and that's sort of like a very technical painter thing. You have to do that in a certain order um, in order to protect the, um, you know, there's just, so that the paint doesn't crack off and fall away. So there's a certain order you have to do. So the drawings help me um, figure out the color, composition, um, get really sure about you know, my content. And um, so I have almost like a map before I make the painting. Um, and then the painting, some parts of it become very technical. Um, and I like to try to make those decisions uh, weave back into the content. So for instance, lately, uh, I've been doing a lot of work that's sort of time sensitive. Um, I'll do an effect or uh, uh, cover a certain amount of the painting um, in such a way that it has to be executed in an afternoon or um, before paint dries in a certain way, like a texture has to be put into it. Um, so, and then that's sort of folded into the content. My next show is sort of about time passing or women and some men kind of measuring time in some way, um, holding positions that are um, unsustainable or um, uh, smoking or um, like drinking a beverage and sort of measuring how that beverage decreases. Um, and then folding that in with this kind of general sense of anxiety and waiting for things to change or um, measuring how things have changed. And I'm also looking at different references um, from, you know, I'm interested in folding in as many different decade references as I can, if that's looking at um, advertising from the 70s or using airbrush in a certain way that really makes reference to the 1980s or color. Um, so sort of putting all of these uh, flag posts in the ground of like time markers. Um, so that's how I like to think about the paintings as having a little bit more of a dialogue with process and um, um, I also think of them as conceptual in the sense that we're moving out of a time when we were really only looking at abstraction critically, if we were looking at painting at all critically. And um, it's funny, the feedback that I get from people when they want to talk about figurative painting is all very, um, comes from like an advertising language or a, um, it's hard for them to absorb a, a painting with an image at, in it as anything other than like um, propaganda or um, they really want to suss out like what's the point, you know, like what are you trying to convince us of? <laughs> um, and I think that's really interesting, just the, that we've lost a language to talk about painted images 
um, that's different from advertising? I, I think it's probably the combination of advertising and the tradition of social realism, yeah. where painting or muralism, where painting right. has, you know, was being used to really hammer you on the head mm -hmm. with uh, very straightforward, not nothing complex actually, right. but, uh, like really this like. Here is the way you have to do. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, it's interesting because your work is uh, technically really, um, you know, like precise and complex and so on. And but the paintings themselves don't seem to be only about the technique. I mean, like I see that you have. Um, kind of like narratives that are being woven throughout the paintings that make a, a body of work, like a, a particular group. So uh, particularly I was looking at the, the second show you had at the gallery, um, The Sons of the Pioneers, mm -hmm. um, which does something that I found interesting, which I would call like the female gaze. You are looking mostly at uh, or only at male subjects, which are in kind of like vulnerable or you know, reflecting pensive positions that are normally reserved for the female subjects. So just to, to hear how you got to that set of ideas and mm -hmm. to the tondos. And mm. um, yeah, so that was my second show with PPOW. Uh, the first show was all children and adolescents. Um, and I think all of my paintings are sort of um, about like uh, American um, expectations or <laughs> American mythologies about identity um, and also a certain amount of like um, self-awareness from the subjects of, I love to think of them as knowing that they're paintings. All the people in the paintings know that they are in fact paintings like in that paradox. Um, and so I wanted to start thinking about gender more um, and gender in America. And I started to paint women and found that I couldn't, I didn't, didn't have the language yet. Um, I didn't know how I wanted to paint them. Uh, and I think I was kind of a little intimidated to paint women, to be totally honest. And, um, you know, precisely because of that history of painting. Um, and so I said, well, uh, let me think about men for a while, because that's just a subject matter that you don't see in painting very often. And then, you know, how could I um, carve out a space for them um, in this painted world where they had that awareness that they were paintings? Um, and what, what would be jarring about that? Like, what painting would they be in that they would be, like, maybe surprised to be in? Or... Um, uh, so it became this sort of manifest destiny narrative. They're somewhere, on their way somewhere to conquer something and they kind of forget their objective or uh, get sort of lost and decide to be still instead. Um, and it's funny, that show went maybe the furthest towards realism that, I don't know, I guess my first show was pretty close to realism, but because they were all children and I was not using children as models. Um, I was using myself a lot or my friends and then turning them into children in the paintings. They had this more, um, I don't know, Norman Rockwell-y, uh, th there were more liberties taken with the forms and the proportions. And um, so the men sort of came closer to realism. And then once I was done with that body of work, um, I think it really just, flung the doors open for me to start painting women because I think I'd taken my oil painting skills kind of to a f fine point and then it kind of, then I was really inspired to like open it up and explore different medium and different techniques and, and just paint the women and not worry about it. <laughs> that was like the permission I needed or something. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question exactly. No, but just how do you get to the, you know, like to the composition, to the set of ideas that you are uh, uh, showing in every painting? And so yeah, on. that's funny to talk about because it's so cumulative. Um, I think maybe there's this understanding that painters go into their studio and they get like struck by a bolt of lightning and it's like, f uh, 
I don't know. I, I'm not saying that you, you think that, I think, but other people that um, ask me that question, I think they're expecting like, again, just like, oh, what's your roadmap from A to B? Like, how do you get successful as an artist? Or, you know, and it's the same kind of question, like how do you paint a painting? It's so mysterious, I don't know. <laughs> and it's different for everybody, but it's like, um, it's really just based on the last painting or the last group of paintings. And, you know, there was something in that that, you know, there was some mistake or, you know, something I did with um, a technique that didn't work out the way I thought it would, but then it did something else incredible and that, you know, made me want to do it again in a different way. And then I'd have to think to myself, like, well, what, what kind of figure or person or environment am I going to paint that allows me to do that technique? And then, th then that'll lead to an idea that'll lead to another idea that's actually about the content or the, mm -hmm. you know, it's just such a um, cycle. Um, it, there's just like, every painting makes another question, um, you know, and so I can't even, the source of it is mysterious to me because it all just started from the beginning, you know, whenever I, when I got out of school and I wanted to paint children, um, I just knew I wanted to paint figures. Um, and again, I think the children was, uh, like as a subject matter, it felt like it was wider open, or there was more I could explore in that world. Um, and then that just led me to the next question and the next question. And so. uh, I mean, like in, in that first show you have a, the name, what was the rescue mission? Oh, rescue, rescue party. party. Rescue yeah. party. The, the, I mean, a lot of the composition feels like it's uh, also drawing references from art historical sources. That mm -hmm. generally you're like, okay, that kind of like feels that, um, not that I have seen it before, but that it's speaking a language that I know. The, and I'm just like, but, and it also has like a kind of like muted palette, the, the colors that you are using, at least in the paintings that I saw are more, uh, are not realistic actually. They, mm -hmm. they feel kind of uh, lighting effects or something. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then in the, in the show that you did after, the, you, you're using almost like neon colors. Mm -hmm. So just like how, I mean, it's just interesting to, to <laughs> just to think, okay, um, how did you decide to look at a painting, like bring something out, or how did you uh, choose colors according to the subject matter? Um, it's funny, it's like a puzzle. Um, I mean, I think everybody, painters probably have, you know, a certain sensibility that's just there um, and that you can't really explain. And then, you know, if I know, for instance, um, you know, I'll, I'll know one piece of the puzzle. I'll know, oh, I want to make this on a round canvas, for instance, because I haven't done that. <laughs> um, and I want to see how that's going to affect the composition and how I'll have to sort of uh, solve the problem inside of the circle. Um, and then, you know, that's going to lead to a different decision about, like, how the figure needs to be arranged. And then that's going to lead to a different decision about, like, well, the lighting should probably be this way so that I can make the viewer feel this or that, um, or ask the viewer to think about feeling this or that. And then, um, you know, that leads me to a color. Um, and, then, and then you're looking for opportunities to maybe like break the rules a little bit and say like, how can I make this look backlit without, you know, or make it ambiguous whether it's backlit or whether this is someone's skin tone. Like, what would I have to do to the colors and the values to make that thing happen? So it's, it really is this moving target. It's like a Rubik's Cube or a, you know, you kind of make one decision and then that helps you make the other one. And then, yeah, with something like color, you know, sometimes all you know, it, that's often like a really nice starting point if you're lost, you know. Sometimes all you know is I want to make her fingertips really pink, <laughs> you know. Um, or the cat has to be black. So, you know, because I have some idea about seeing that and I need to see that. Um, and then everything else kind of forms around it. Um, but yeah, I don't know what makes, you know, with this painting, he... Well, it's gone now, but um, he, that mask uh, was camouflaged. It was one of these hunting masks that you can buy at Walmart, and I wanted to 
paint that mask to make it as, you know, to do the opposite of what it was supposed to do, which is to camouflage you or, you know, conceal you and to make it um, as attention grabbing as possible, which, you know, led me to those colors. So, yeah, it's any, it's a mystery, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because every painting, I think, from the Robin's first show, um, like this painting or the, you know, I particularly love the woman, uh, it's called Swoon at the Well, I think, at, the, uh, at, well, the, water at the water pump. You know, I'd go into the gallery and I'd see this image, or this image too, it's just, you know, the, the, the skirt is so unbelievably painted and it's a small part of the painting because there's so much else going on and, you know, sometimes I go look at the milk coming out of the udders and look at her expression or going back to the water pump, I remember in Robin's first show eight years ago, I'd go out and just fall in love with the skirt. But there was this woman blown over sort of by history <laughs> through the technique of the way she painted it. And I felt this one. So I'd just be this, I kind of identified with her. I just felt overwhelmed by <laughs> figurative painting and paintings of women, you know, in repose. But here is Robin's <laughs> version. And I could just so identify with her. But the skirt, I thought, Robin just wanted to paint that skirt. That's incredible. And, you know, then you look at all the little flowers and details, but the, and the bucket, you know, it's all that texture, but the whole meaning is overwhelming also. So you can see from her speaking, it's like amazingly technical and um, like, a, like someone putting together a car or something. I mean, <laughs> but it has this emotional, every painting has a strong emotional quality and then you can get lost in the details. Uh, like talking about the details, so you were saying that you're, the, the people in your paintings are quite aware that they are paintings somehow. And what I'm curious about then is if there is some kind of uh, a narrative that took them to that point. So this woman that's in the floor with her petticoats or whatever mm -hmm. this skirt is called, how did she end up there and does something happen afterwards? Mm. Or is it just a freeze, like a, like a single image that... I don't know, that's what I... I mean, that's, the, that's what's tricky about narrative painting and what I think is really interesting about it right now. I mean, I think it didn't... Coming from an illustration background, there was always this like real fear of putting too much narrative into a painting. It was like kind of a no-no a and it was like... Um, I always was terrified to do it and like couldn't do anything else. <laughs> but do th I was just so drawn to it and also so scared that it was gonna mean it wasn't a painting. Um, and I don't know if that's what attracts me to it maybe that, um, uh, you know, I think artists like to be told they can't do certain things and then try to figure out a way to do it anyway. Um, and. Yeah, like the narrative in a painting, I think as I've, you know, over the course of making this work and like lately I'm trying to pare it down as much as possible. Like what are the, the fewest elements that could be in a painting so that you know exactly as much as you need to know and no more and you don't get the end of the story and you can imagine it on either side but, um, you know, like, okay, so just the bag and the cigarette and the glasses and the pose and this, like, psychedelic sky. Or there's another painting that's been cycling through of a woman smoking on a gravestone and, um, you know, just paring down. The, this painting came from a 70s uh, cigarette ad and I knew I wanted to do this airbrush in the background um, which makes reference to this like photo world, um, this advertising world, but when it's up against this very thick impasto oil paint, which is her body, it kind of like makes you more aware of those surfaces. So you can't just get lost in the story as well. Like I want the viewer to toggle back and forth between a narrative and um, like just the visceralness of it as a painting. Um, and the more I can kind of get those things like butting up against each other in an uncomfortable way, um, like just 
And, and my work now is becoming more about that, like weird edges butting up against each other. And you could sort of argue that that's what narrative painting is too. It's like a, an idea that it's hard to square with painting, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is the, your third show with the gallery, right? Your mm -hmm. sense of grace is showing. Oh, your good so, taste, or your good taste, your good taste is showing. Why did yeah. I make sense of grace? <laughs> okay, it's, uh, your good taste is showing. So in, for this one, I think I can see Balthus there. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, but and, uh, some secret advertising, as you were uh, yes. saying. So um, it's like how, like, and it's, I mean, like, was it a decision uh, for this show to be showing um, female subjects? Like mm -hmm. the... Um, yeah, so that last painting uh, was called Your Good Taste is Showing, which was the title of the show. Um, and that was, um, there was a cigarette ad um, of a woman in, um, she was styled to kind of look like um, the girl with the pearl earring. She looked like a Vermeer painting. Mm -hmm. um, she was an African-American woman sort of smoking and giving that kind of you know, come hither look uh, at the viewer uh, and the copy was your good taste is showing. And I just thought there was so much in that ad about, um, you know, sex appeal, race, class. Um, it just felt like this weird time capsule. It could kind of only have been made in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that sort of like overtness um, about all of those <laughs> tensions, I think has gotten, um, people are more careful about that now or something, but it felt like a, like a collective subconscious, um, you know, it was like a admission. Um, and they were, it was an advertisement making a reference to a painting. So I wanted to then fold it back in, making it a painting uh, that was making reference to an advertisement that was also making reference to a different painting. <laughs> Um, just to sort of draw all these points of connection and then to give the figure the like agency to just tell us the subtext. You know, you, we see so many images where the subtext is purposefully, you know, it's supposed to be all subliminal. We're not supposed to understand what we're seeing. Um, and so it's just like cathartic to make an image that just puts the feeling at the forefront um, or puts the, the, f the feeling of repulsion at the forefront, you know, like we absorb all of these images and we're not supposed to be visually literate enough to understand them, but they're supposed to affect us um, and for better or for worse, you know, they could give us a solution to feel better or they could make us feel marginalized and horrible. <laughs> and, um, not that I'm like, I never want to sound like I'm railing against advertising because I think that's way too simple. It's not as if I'm saying that advertising is like the enemy or anything, but I, when I find a specific advertisement that I feel like um, is capitalizing on our um, visual illiteracy, then I want to like make it accessible in a different way, um, able to access with a different set of feelings or something. Do you work from with models or from photographs, found images? Um, so as the work has progressed, I'm using models less and less. Um, and sometimes using photographs, but always trying to, because I make these drawings before I make the paintings, like they kind of get laundered through my hand more. Um, so I'm trying to imagine them more, uh, distort them more, um, kind of extrude them back through a painting or a drawing language again, um, whereas these were much more from models, yeah, and uh, photographs I took of people who are modeling for me. So that's kind of evolved and changed, yeah. And uh, Wendy, how is it for you to, to speak, when you have to speak about Robin's work to someone at the gallery booth, for example? It's, it's great to speak about Robin's work. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, like, this, there's so many layers, as, as she's yeah, uh, describing. Yeah, and I think, you know, in our gallery, just from a gallery point of view, you know, um, we have a really 
fabulous, intelligent, brilliant staff of a diverse group of ages and um, genders. And I think everyone, you know, we have conversations that enlighten us in talking about your work and different people from the gallery also meet with Robin. You know, we have um, really good conversations and often like at the art fairs and at the gallery, you know, when it's as a dealer and talking about the work of the artist is one level, but then once you present it to the public and you're talking, a lot of times you learn. I mean, a lot of times you actually, when talking to a viewer, come to a realization that you didn't even have with the artist. So I always think that's really interesting. And I always remember when I was younger, um, and this happens with Robin's show too and all the artists we show, sometimes I felt there was a funny thing that happened. And that is, you have the show and you begin to talk about it while it's up. And then by the end of the show, which is basically six weeks, you finally understand the show completely <laughs> and the show comes down. But it's a learning experience. You know, it sounds cliche, but it truly is a learning experience. And um, that's why I brought up, you know, the painting about the water pump, because I remember seeing it more clearly as the time of the show went on. And the, so talking about it is, um, is great, because everyone brings you know, different narratives to it. People in the gallery bring different narratives to it. People come in and give tours. And it, it's a very um, active experience. And talking about Raman's work is also that, of course. And uh, Robin, you were saying that you make between 12 and 15 paintings a year. Um, that's not so many, actually. That's, uh, um, the, but is this because each painting is so time consuming or because that's the kind of, uh, your own limits, uh, meaning you don't want to make more than that? Um, it's, it's sort of about, it's maybe both. Um, yeah, well, and I, I gave you that answer when I'm working full time, you know, at other times when I've, you know, been teaching or, you know, doing other jobs, I certainly don't even make that many paintings. So that's when I'm, I'm working full time. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's weird as a young artist, um, I felt like whatever other job I was doing, I also had to work 40 hours make a week making paintings. And so for a while I was, you know, working 80 hour weeks. And I think, you know, when you're a young person, you can do that for a while um, and still make good work or make progress. But the older I got, the more I realized that um, I really had to pace myself and that, um, you know, I would go into the studio completely drained and try to make something and, and make terrible decisions and not think far enough ahead, not strategize, um, not ask myself what I really wanted or what was really interesting. There was this um, self-imposed idea that I just had to work during this time and do something that I couldn't be idle. So I've really moved away from that and now um, much more willing to, you know, especially as my process has changed and there are certain things that I have to do, you know, I know I need four hours to do this um, and I have to, it sort of has to be um, start to finish, I can't stop. Um, so I'll, you know, if I can fit that into a day, I'll do that and if I can't for whatever reason, then I'm, you know, try to get some other, you know, work done or just take some time off. <laughs> or, so there's like a, a built-in um, like leisure, I guess, that I've allowed myself because I've discovered that it's really good for the work. Um, and that usually yields, you know, the amount of paintings that it yields. Um, I, can I just add to that? I think that um, from my perspective, um, and what's really, um, you know, the, being an artist is a fragile lifestyle, and you never know um, how your income is, source is going to be. But, you know, like Robin teaches, which I think is good. I think artists having not, if you don't have, you know, wealth, you have to have a job. Um, but there comes times when you can uh, work less and work more in the studio. Um, but for many years, and looking at all these paintings, Robin was working other jobs and trying to scrape together. I think when I met Robin, she didn't even have a whole studio to herself. She had a corner 
of a loft. Literally, that first time I went, when I didn't know if she was a man or a woman. I didn't I have walked, a wall. You didn't I didn't even have a wall. Had an I easel. went into a, uh, on the Bowery, I think, right? Where it was, was it? on Lafayette. Yeah, it was in Soho. It was just like a corner of someone's loft. It wasn't, didn't even have walls. And then Robin eventually got a studio with another artist and now has her own studio um, and can support herself on her work and devote her time to her work. So as a dealer, um, it's sort of um, it's such a happy, good thing because she has now the time to, to make the work. But as technical as they are, you can hear that she, even with the time and the luxury, it still takes, it's still only really 12 paintings a year, but maybe the paintings um, have more time to, sh she can work them out better. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that as a get dealer gallerist relationship, it's really um, great to see Robin going in eight years from the corner of someone's studio on an easel to her own studio where she can work full time, so. And um, when they have a seat for you, if you, I guess you only have 12 paintings of Robin <laughs> a year, so what happens if, uh, if somebody wants more, and you know, if... It's tough, it's really, really hard. And, um, you know, Robin gets invited to a lot of shows and she wants to show in other cities. And we try to, it's, it's kind of a new thing we're trying to navigate. And Robin's been invited recently into a lot of group shows by, of women. So there's a lot of shows that are just women artists, women figurative painters. And we're, tr we're thinking quite carefully, and there's not a lot, there's no, there's no paintings in the studio, so where does that work come from for those shows, and which shows do you choose to ask collectors to lend to, or ask Robin to put her next painting in, rather than put in an exhibition or an art fair? It's, it's a little bit of a quandary and a struggle, and we're trying together to make really good, clear decisions that won't um, label Robin as an artist of the moment, because there's so many women artists doing figurative paintings. And like some shows Robin's asked to be in, the curators don't even see the paintings. They're like, we just want a Robin Williams painting. So we have to talk through each one and see who's asking and what the context is and how, who will lend. It's a juggling act and it's hard. But it's not a bad problem to have either. <laughs> and um, I mean, like, there are, you know, the, when you're uh, talking about different mediums like video or installation and sculpture and so on, that is addition, you have, you know, like, okay, so this, an addition of three and the AP. So, of course, as a painter, you don't have an AP. Um, um, are there any works that you keep for yourself of your own uh, works or everything goes out? Um, I'm just starting to try to do that. Uh, that's new. Um, before, I just, anything that needed to go out went out. Um, and I'm trying to hold on to a few more of the drawings at this stage and some smaller works and then mm, trying to be discerning about squirreling something away while also, you know, not <laughs> depriving anyone a good question. of the moment. Yeah, a like, you know, you do wrestle with that because you spend a long time, you know, maybe people aren't buying your work and then suddenly they're buying it um, and you want to, you know, be able to enjoy that and enjoy a certain amount of success um, and weigh that against, you know, deciding to keeps a few things so that you have control, a little bit more control over the market and what happens to your work. And um, so, yeah, that's something I'm just starting to try to figure out. Um, and it's tricky because also you want, you know, you want people to see them. Um, your initial desire, especially when there's like finally some eyes on your work is to make sure that it gets seen. Well, um, you can, I would not, advocate this for many pieces, but some artists do in an exhibition say this piece, unless it's gonna go to a museum or somewhere, um, I'd rather not sell it, I wanna keep it. So you can do that mm -hmm. also. I mean, there's ways of doing it, but um, that's um, a good question. The, the, so, I mean, like, just like trying to go to follow that uh, thread. So you got, your, you know, your work got noticed and there's a demand for it and that's great. And uh, 
that was maybe with your first show at uh, PPOW? Um, the first show sold pretty well. Um, the first show sold well. Yeah. And, and, the, and got real good press mm -hmm. and sold well. The second show, not quite as much, because <laughs> I think there was there were different uh, trends happening in the art world, and then really it's just been this last show where there's been um, a lot more attention on the work and conversation around it and opportunities to show it. So the the real question is, um, how did that affect retroactively your older work, your early work, the, the mm. things that you were doing in 2013, let's say, or. You know, like, How did it affect, in, yeah, what, like, in what sense? Okay, um, if that work was still in your studio or at Robin's gallery, uh, oh. at Robin, at Wendy's gallery, like, is, you know, like, is there, like, does it shift the there way have, of looking yeah. at it? There, yeah, it's, everything's not, yes. <clears throat> With Robin's current success, looking back at the paintings of the men, which were, you know, the less, I, I don't even want to call them least successful, because I think they're very successful paintings. Um, and since then, we have placed a few of those paintings that we didn't place in the show um, because they're, people can see them now in a way they didn't see them then. I mean, that happened, too, with a painting um, we had in Robin's last show. We showed it quite a lot. It was, had, it was with another gallery. We had it at Miami Basel last year, mm -hmm. and then we brought it to Freeze, and it was... It looked fabulous. I don't know. Sometimes it's just the context and the timing. Um, you know, it's not a simple, like art is just not uh, so simple. You <laughs> know, a lot of paintings that many people that were disregarded in their time later on become super famous and important, relevant. There's not a real, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter success of one show. I'm sure every artist who's, you know, um, had a long career will tell you that a show they failed was actually their best show. It's just, it just doesn't work like that. Like the press and the sales, it doesn't, it feels at the time really bad, but you know, 10 or 20 years later, it's meaningless, honestly, because the world has changed and people have new eyes and maybe, you know, sometimes you have a show and people see it. This has happened to us so many times and maybe with that show, nothing happens, but there are many people who see it who aren't writers and buyers and museums who are young curators or students or artists who love it. And they have no way of expressing it. Um, but then later on, they become teachers or writers, or, and they're like, that show made such a difference to me. And at the time, we thought no one cared. But it's not true, really. Yeah, and that's, I think, <laughs> and it's been great working with you because you were always reminding me of that. <laughs> when I was young, younger, and um, discouraged, and um, you know, disheartened, and impatient. Um, that has been a, a great thing about our relationship, I think, just being able to be reminded of that, and um, reassured that, because I think other galleries that are, you know, um, have different goals, or aren't looking at, uh, haven't been around as long or don't understand these trends, you know, they're more likely to say, like, if you didn't do well, then you're not right for us, you know? And, um, and then that can be, I think, hard for an artist to, you know, you internalize that. <laughs> you just think you're not any good. Um, so, so, yeah, that's been important to keep that in perspective. Um, like Going uh, into your relationship a little bit, so you went to this loft not knowing if you were going to see a man or a woman. <laughs> you went to this corner of this loft, and um, during the conversation that you had at first studio visit, what is what made you think, okay, I want her? How, how did that happen? Great question. That's a really good question. Um, well, I was happy to see she was a woman, because that definitely fit. Um, I'm always, we always have shown women artists. Um, not because they're women artists, but because we really identified with the subject matter um, as women dealers. Um, and I suppose that was part of it as well, but I think it was because of our um, passion for painting and it started when we were very young. I like to think that 
I can, I, you know, I didn't, I was an English major in college. I don't even have an art history degree, but somehow when I was very young, I felt like I knew what was good and what wasn't. So I think after 35 years, I can confidently say my gut instinct, and maybe it was the way Robin painted a silver balloon on the head of a little child that looked like earmuffs and something psychological that I identified with, and the painting I saw at BAM, and the images and the technique, even though it's really, really different than what she's doing now. You know, I just, I had a hunch that this person had talent, and you know, also I could see she was, um, you know, there's a chemistry you have immediately with someone, and you're like, um, you know, I, I'd like to get to know this person more, rather than I, you know, I can't work with this person, it's really difficult. So, um, you know, all, all the stars were sort of lined up, and then I can't remember how long it was between the studio visit and the first show. Me either. Oh, I what think year was that? For? Yeah, I can't remember. I don't know. Because all that work was not in your studio. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that time is very fuzzy. That was also like shortly after like the economy really crashed. I think everybody was, I remember in my, the other gallery that I was with had just shut down. I think I went through a breakup. <laughs> so it was, I don't really remember that period very clearly, but I think you might've put something, I think I you- think we had art fairs or some work and things or- I think you, just, you put something uh, in like a viewing room first. Um, but we had such confidence. We had opened a new space in that 2004, right? What year? It was 2010. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Robin was our opening show for that space. So we in immediately had, you know, we didn't want to, a lot of galleries open a new space. And we had done this also where you have a group show of all your artists, which I felt we didn't want to do that. It's confusing and never looks good. We're going to just put all our eggs in one basket. And it was, you know, Really beautiful, great show, and you know. But since then, it's been you know ups and downs. It's not been just oh here we are at Basel on a panel. It yeah. didn't happen so easily. Um, our hour is almost up. Uh, we are going to open the floor for questions from the audience. I just have one last question for you before uh, we open it up. And so the, you went to the BAM to see a theater play with your daughter, and you <laughs> saw this painting. What was the painting? It was a painting of a child dressed like a Native American with feathers, like a white child in a raft. Mm. We did yeah, you're right. Going down, it was quite large. Mm -hmm. And there was something so strange about the iconography and it was a very large painting. Um, and I just looked at that child in that raft with the feathers, that vulnerable, strange image and thought, yeah, well, I'll go to that studio. <laughs> Okay, so we have 15 minutes for questions now. Um, I guess. Over there. Where do you teach and are you a member of the West Chelsea Artists? Um, well, it's funny. I actually, I'm taking the year off from teaching uh, now, uh, but I was teaching at a uh, School of Visual Arts, um, although I was teaching in the illustration department um, because, uh, well, I didn't get an MFA. Uh, and I studied illustration. So um, it's funny that sort of leaves a little door open for teaching. Normally, you know, they expect you to have an MFA, but because il illustrators aren't really expected, they don't have a, a higher degree. So, um, so that was my sort of way in. Um, and and your, the second part of your question? Um, no, I don't, you should tell me more about that later. <laughs> Um, over there. Uh, other than the advertising, um, I'm just curious about all the smoking. Mm -hmm. Is there something else lurking underneath there? Everybody asks about the smoking. <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about it. But so, so unusual in our time to see that. Yeah, well, I think it's... Um, I'm interested in cigarettes as like a visual... Um, Touchstone. There's just a lot wrapped up in them psychologically and visually. They're very gestural. They like allow me to paint hands. Um, they're also incredibly sexual. Um, and in terms of advertising, like I, my way into them was through advertising because I think um, as an object, 
they do promise everything. Um, I, when I was looking at all of these ads from the 70s and I was interested in the 70s, um, you know, because of um, sort of what was happening politically with feminism then and I wanted to see how that was affecting the ads and cigarettes felt like an interesting place to look um, because you really did have the spectrum um, of how femininity was expressed. Um, so there were ads with women, you know, smoking in meadows in this very sort of like nature goddess manner. And then there were ads of women um, in this kind of very like stark frontal feminist confrontational, like I smoke because I've earned it sort of, um, or like you've come a long way, baby. There's just all these sort of, um, it's like buried treasure of, um, the way that people's understanding about women was shifting in those ads, um, and in specifically in cigarette ads, because they are this product that promises to make you into whoever you want to be. Um, and I think the reason why they were, you know, so popular and so addictive, not just because they were physically <laughs> addictive, but because they promised you the identity that you wanted. Um, and so now, I'm, I, my, Lately, I've been painting women vaping. Um, uh, you know, because people would start to ask me if I was, you know, romanticizing smoking or if I, they always asked me if I smoked and if, if I, you know, if I had a judgment about smoking, if I was trying, again, like this sort of propaganda idea. They're trying to understand if I'm trying to tell them uh, what I think morally or ethically about smoking through the paintings. And I, but try to explain that it's really not about that. There's sort of like a visual tool to lead to the, all these other things. So I thought then like, oh, how would it feel to see a woman vaping? Like, what does that mean? What's the significance of that? And it's so funny, I think I posted an image of a woman with a, a, a vaping a drawing I hadn't, and, and a detail of it. I hadn't even finished the painting and I got more comments and responses of people being like, that's my jewel, jewel life. Like, <laughs> everybody got very excited to see. Uh, and I, it's about identity, you know? They could identify with that. It was theirs, it said something about them. Um, and I think it says something really interesting about the moment, too. There's this stigma around smoking. It's sort of, um, you know, less and less accepted socially and culturally. And then, like, what does it mean to vape, to do this thing that's supposedly safe for you? Uh, there's, I guess the jury's still out on that. Um, it, but it takes that kind of, like, daredevil, death wish, the danger, dangerous sexiness out of it. And now it's sort of more about, like, getting the substance. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't vape, so I should maybe ask people that vape, but if I'm just pontificating about what I think it means culturally. Um, I just find those things interesting. They seem like good subjects for paintings. I think over there. Question to Wendy. I want to ask about the other examples of working with different artists besides Robin, how you found that, how you finding them out, like how you start to work with them? Um, it happens in you know, I, we've been doing this for 35 years, so it's like a lot of stories. Um, I'm going to try to think of some more recent specific things. Well, we show an artist named Carlos Mota, and the way we, and we're about to have our second show with him. And we met him through collectors of ours who are very supportive of the work of David Wanarovich, and we've known them for a really long time. And they really know our program, and they saw Carlos's work in the east, in the Lower East Side, in a gallery, and they said you should know Carlos Mota. So actually, those same collectors and good friends of ours also encouraged us to show Carolee Schneeman. So collectors, often who know us and know what we like, and are very involved in um, looking and listening and hearing things through curators and other artists, are really good sources of information. Of course, other artists are always a good source of information. Um, also, you know, we do go to a lot of fairs, you know, going, I saw an interesting artist, I thought, at FIAC, and then I meet the dealer, and then I go to the artist studio. Um, and, you know, you just really have to, 
I think um, be, a, be willing to look and keep your ears open. It is not through people sending emails or dropping off packages or coming at the fair. It's always, that's not how it happens at all. It's usually through other artists, collectors, or through ourselves meeting a dealer who we have similar ideas and programs and we can share information. And you know, knowing other dealers and knowing um, you have the same approach, you have the same vision, you have the same way of working, and working together with those dealers and seeing what they work with. You know, going to biennials, all this, but it's like a community, it's a community of respect and you just, that's really how it works for us. Um, I guess over there, there is a question. Yes. Bueno, quiero pedirte en especial que me ayudes a traducir lo que quiero preguntar. Lo que quiero preguntar, eh, mi, mi inglés es un poquito... No, <risa> dilo en español, está bien. Ok. Eh, primero quiero felicitarles, la relación entre galerista y artista es hermosa. Eh, se nota el aprecio que tiene el, la, el artista con el galerista. Eh, quiero que me ayudes a preguntarles, a, a preguntar al artista, ¿qué siente en el proceso creativo cuando descubre las formas y los colores? Eh, ¿Qué sensación emocional la tiene? ¿Y qué siente el galerista cuando descubre un artista que tiene esta sensación? Ok. Um, a ver, a ver el intento. Uh, first, es like a congratulating you both on the relationship that you have, that it's quite evident the appreciation you have for each other. And then the question is, um, what do you, uh, Robin, what do you feel when you get to find the shapes, forms, and colors, if you, get, if you have a kind of like emotional response to that? And uh, you, Wendy, like how, do, in turn, how that makes you feel? It's more about like your emotional responses to the work. Um, yeah, I think, there's a lot of, um, that's what's hard to talk about as an artist, uh, that just a lot of it is like emotional and intuitive and, and also process-based. Like it, it is, again, it's not like a thunderbolt that hits you, um, but it is like this rolling sense of what should come next, uh, what feels right. Uh, I mean, I keep noticing triangles in my work over and over again, and negative spaces that um, whenever there's a triangle, I'm like, yes, <laughs> I did something right. <laughs> like, it, um, so for some reason I have like, you know, and particularly like long skinny triangles or like triangles that really feel like arrows that are very directional. Um, you know, they also have this sense of being like a pyramid, so sometimes they're very, they can either be incredibly stable or incredibly unstable. Um, so that's like a form that I f feel like shows up a lot and um, that I usually get like this excitement or like satisfaction when it just comes out of the drawing um, and then winds up in the painting. And yeah, I think color is so emotional. Um, and for me, also, just um, like experimental or um, it's not always like I have a feeling and so I want to see a color. It's like I want to surprise myself or I want to um, wanna see how a color with another color will make me feel. So it's like more of an investigation and less of a like, I feel this way, so I'm going to use red. Um, it's like, how can I feel this way but see like beige and navy together and make that feeling still come out of those colors or, um, yeah, I hope that <laughs> answered it, okay. And just tr briefly, I think for me, um, you know, you go to the studio and then the work comes into the gallery and then you bring it to an exhibition or an art fair and it's not for me like, oh my God, every single painting Robin made, it's just genius, amazing, it's great. It's like, a, it's like you have to live with it and see it and talk about it. And, um, and then as you change, as the conversations you have and the context you put it in, it changes. 
And um, so that's it's an experience. It's not like in the moment, you know, oh, I, you know, sometimes yes, you're like, oh, I can't believe this painting, you know. But not every painting is going to be like that for any artist I show or any like, installation or photograph. You know, it's a, it's a journey. <laughs> I guess uh, question over there, and then we have, do we still have two I'm more questions too. there? Hi. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was going to take the guy in the back, mm -hmm. and then I come back to the two of you. Question for Wendy, uh, kind of a funny question. What is your honest opinion, your honest opinion, <laughs> of Damien Hirst's spot paintings? I do not have an honest opinion because I know nothing about them. <laughs> I mean, honest, I can tell you honestly, for me to say I think they're bad would be dishonest of me because I know from experience that I have made in the past knee-jerk judgments about artists and then I talk to someone who's passionate or I read something and put it in a different context and what it means culturally can mean something very different than what it means as an object. So I can't really tell you because as a dealer, I spend very little time thinking about other artists' work than the artists I show, which has really saved Penny and I because we live in our world, and our world is great. And I don't have to look at other people's things that don't relate to me, but I will not give you, like, say something that I, I can't judge something I know nothing about, really. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Robin, I, I really admire your work a lot. Thanks. And I noticed that in your very first exhibit, the works were kind of improvised. Like you said, you weren't really worried about capturing exact likenesses of these children. You just kind of used some people to kind of influence your direction. And then you felt you know, that you needed to kind of get very realistic with the male. Um, exhibit that you did, and it didn't really connect as much with people, and now you said that you're empowered to paint women, but I noticed that you're not really, um, you, you said you moved away from models, and like in the joggers, the, the, the figures look almost identical, so can you talk a little bit about that, about why you are... Um, I mean, they do have kind of a graphic quality to them, um, but you want, you're, you're moving away from that kind of graphic, you don't like the advertising kind of aspect to it. Like, you know, people trying to find some sort of meaning in it. Mm -hmm. But yet the figures themselves, they look very um, almost Art Deco-ish and kind of like you're making up. Mm. Um, is that intentional? Uh, or, or something that you're just, just happened? Um, I mean, I think it's very process-based. I think that's another misconception about figurative painting and my own misconception like that I, I had to overcome and understand through process in making figurative paintings um, is that I thought it's, it's come much more, a lot more of my decisions have come out of the process of my materials and the decisions I'm making about, um, for instance, like if I want to use airbrush, um, I'm using that tool to sort of make a reference to maybe advertising or like that kind of Photoshop finish um, or like a, a photo real kind of mark without making the forms photo real. Um, so just trying to use sort of turn these references inside out instead of it being so one-to-one. -one. Um, and the image um, that I found to help me with that painting, it, it was a photograph, um, but it was two women running uh, and they had very different bodies than the um, bodies that I made for that painting. Uh, and I mostly used it just to see the sun hit a form. You know, it was just like a very loose light reference. Um, and I knew that I wanted, I knew in my mind, I just wanted to see a man and a woman jogging toward the viewer together. Um, and I just needed to go out and take whatever I needed to help me build that image. 
Um, and I guess the more I've, the longer I've been painting, just the more I trust myself to build it um, with fewer um, direct references. Um, and then, and the decisions about the forms are often coming out of, you know, whether I'm choosing to use oil paint or airbrush or some other kind of effect to build up the skin or the body. Like, it's amazing how much that just informs, uh, you know, the arc of a leg if you're taping it off. Um, there's just a natural thing that the tape wants to do and just letting that guide me in the process more than being like, no, I have this photo and I need it to look like this because this is here. And um, so just letting a lot of that stuff fall away and letting the process guide me more um, has determined how they look. Um, any more questions? Um, <laughs> and I notice also your, when you say about breakup and you start smiling, so I'm thinking, I'm sure this is much more than being a professional. Oh, well, Wendy didn't know about my breakup. I didn't know. I kept that those, Robin and close I to actually, my chest. <laughs> we, are, we have a really good relationship. We both work really hard and we both trust each other a lot. So we're not like, we're not spending a lot of time talking about our personal lives together. And if it comes up, it comes up. And if it doesn't, but we're busy people who are working hard. And I think we know intuitively we're both fine. So there, there's not a lot of like drama. And there's not a lot of that. It's really mostly uh, uh, a painter and a dealer <laughs> working together <laughs> to try to keep, you know, to keep uh, sane in this world. And you? Just wait for the microphone for a second. Hi, my question um, is to Robin about the history of painting that you really kind of tip your hat to. I'm curious as female painters, if that's something for that moment you feel, like this moment in particular to where we've come as a, as a female painter. Mm, I'm not sure I understand. Um, I'm kind of curious about your background in, in that art history or if you feel like that's just intuitive from looking at other paintings throughout history. Well, I think as just a painter and a figurative painter, flat out, um, you're just looking at what came before you, um, you know, for guidance and inspiration and just curiosity and interest. Um, and to, you know, just to see how somebody else thought to do something, thought to solve a problem or um, th thought how to, you know, just organize a form inside of a rectangle or circle, what, <laughs> if you will. Um, and then as a woman, um, you're just bathed in these images and kind of like when I was describing, you know, seeing an advertisement that like, you know, gave me sort of like a uncomfortable feeling or when you're seeing that there's something missing or seeing that there's something that like can't be addressed because of you know who painted it or the history or the time that it was painted or um, and then you see all the implications of those images and how they've trickled into you know down into everything else that we consume and you know just feeling like there's something that could be investigated or you know turned around or flipped on its head so that you can see the thing that nobody's saying or um, you know the part of the painting that's making you as a woman feel uncomfortable or um, feels unaddressed or, um, and, and that just feels like a natural response, um, as a figurative painter who happens to be a woman, you just notice those things and then those things are interesting to you and you're curious about them and, you know, when I'm making a painting, I'm trying always, this has been another thing that I'm really trying to pay attention to and that I've learned about myself over the course of, um, you know, my professional career is to ask myself if I'm making a painting because I'm curious to see it or because I want somebody else to see something, you know, my way. I'm 
trying to put that aside and really trying to focus on, you know, make my intention about, um, am I, will making this painting be, you know, scratch an itch for me because I want to see how it feels to, for it to be in the world. Um, and so, yeah, if history is coming in through that, you know, there's a reaction to something I've seen that like, oh, I want to see it if it was like this, you know, what if I did this to it, how would that feel? Um, that's how I try to approach those things. Um, then, yeah, no, just one second. She had two questions and uh, uh, her. <laughs> I have two questions for Wendy. Um, how many artists do you work with, the, the gallery work with on the average? Um, um, per, on our website, I don't really know the exact number, but there might be 25 artists on the website. Okay, my second question is that obviously you have this really, I mean the gallery and you personally, have this wonderful relationship working with Robin. And um, on the other side, um, what would be the key factors other than the artist's work don't sell? Um, what would be the key factors that either the artist or the gallery would discontinue the relationship? Um, not selling is not necessarily the reason we would discontinue showing an artist. The reason we would not want to work with an artist is because we could not serve that artist well. We would have to not be able to promote their career in the way they deserve because we're not the right people for it. So some point over 35 years, you've taken on artists at different times and you just don't have the, 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 the um, your, 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 your viewers, your buyers, your collectors, your audience is not interested in that artist's work. And the gallery has to have a defined um, program. It's really, really important because it creates a reason for the gallery. And every single artist has to, or most of them, have to contribute to the reason I'm an art dealer. The reason I'm an art dealer is not because I like the lifestyle or I think <laughs> it's fun or I want to stand around openings and drink or put pictures on a wall and sell them. That is not ever the reason from the day we opened. So the community that we have um, who sees us has an expectation and some of the artists really just don't fit in. You just don't know that all the time. So they need to be in a gallery where they do fit in, where the dealer can really promote them and really sell their work so they can be supported. And so the artists, so that would be a conversation we have to have with artists. And we've had it over the years. And in many instances, they find galleries that they're much happier in. I mean, it's sad and it's unfortunate and it's a pity when something doesn't work out. But it's not the end of a road it's potentially the beginning of something good. And to have an artist um, linger on someone's website or linger in their stable, which is such a stupid, silly word to me for artists, um, is, un is not fair. It's like having, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just not healthy. So it does happen, but the reason really is, I hope I have explained it clearly. And I think we take our last question, I, which was, you? I'm sorry? Ah, okay. Um, I'll just ask a question. How do you come up with the price for your paintings? And who exactly maybe comes up to the certain price? And uh, yes, that would be my question. The prices? Yes. How do you come up with the prices? Like who is, who is the one who determines the artist or the dealer or supply basically? I think it's the dealer who steers that conversation unless the artist has a history. You know, with Robin, she didn't really, she had a little history, but she didn't have a, a lot of history. So it's a different conversation if you have an artist who's been showing for 20 years, you know. Um, but we try to be sensible with pricing. Um, we, um, you know, in a case when paintings are in demand, it's just supply and demand without being, you know, we try not to make prices too high because if there's a change in the economy or, you know, we try to be rational about it. It's, you know, money's always 
in the art world, you know, you hear about a tiny little percentage of artists who are making, you know, three million dollars, you know, for every painting, but that's very small. So um, we try to, you know, raise the prices as the demand increases, and um, that's sort of it. And where do you start? You know, you have a young artist and you think, how do you price this work? And it's really, it's, a, it's kind of a mysterious, mysterious number you come up with and that's how you start. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes you don't sell work and it's still, the price goes up. It's not, a, it's not like, um, you know, selling shirts. It's, there's a, sometimes some things that don't sell get more expensive later on. It's sort of funny that way. I think that's the end of our <laughs> wonderful end money. Yeah. Yeah, time together. So. <laughs>